All right, can you hear me? I can. Oh, great, I can hear you on the radio, too. Good. Good, okay, figured that out. Sorry, everybody, about that. All right, I have Michael Weldon on the phone from Georgia, or calling from Georgia. Do you want to uh, introduce yourself? Uh, well, yes, I, I'm from Lakewood and uh, lived there, grew up there and lived there for like 25 years, went to Lakewood High School, uh, relocated to New York, lived there for a long time, and uh, I uh, published uh, Psychotronic Video Magazine for 18 years and had two books of Psychotronic uh, movie reviews published, and uh, after I moved to Virginia, where I lived for 13 years, I started a radio show, which I'm just restarting this week oh, cool. um, from, from Augusta, Georgia. Augusta, Georgia. And how long have you been in uh, Georgia? Um, less than a year. Less than a year. And you said you were in Virginia last, huh? Yeah, we were on the eastern shore. My wife and I were on the eastern shore of Virginia for 13 years. Wow. And uh, going back to Lakewood days, you were um, you're well known for being in the band The Mirrors. Or mirrors, nope. I guess. No, no, known by some people, yes. I was in the original lineup of mirrors uh, that that played out um, around the early seventies. Right, um, and there was just a a release called "Hands in My Pockets" a few years back, uh, compiling everything you recorded, I believe. Pretty much, yeah. Great. So, um, so you were born in the northeastern Ohio area, born around Lakewood, I guess. And, uh, in Lakewood, yeah. In, you were born actually at the hospital in Lakewood, wow. I was born at Lakewood Hospital, as were my two brothers, yes. And how did you first get interested in the, coin, or the term you coined, psychotronic movies? Uh, well, it, it happened uh, when I was very small, you know, both watching movies on local TV uh, stations um, and going to uh, movie theaters, uh, some with my parents or grandparents, but usually with uh, other kids at Saturday matinees. And I have uh, very strong memories of all the movie theaters uh, in Lakewood and most of Cleveland, and uh, most of them I went to, some of them I went to, you know, all the time. Right, and uh, your, the opening of your book, uh, on the Psychotronic Encyclopedia of Film, you, you dedicate it to um, a whole bunch of movie theaters that were around northeastern Ohio, northeastern Ohio. Yeah. Well, mo most of them which I've never heard of. The Hippodrome, that sounds cool. That was the most awesome, largest theater in, in Greater Cleveland. Where was that at? And, oh, that was on Euclid, uh, downtown. Okay. And... Uh, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. Yeah, all these yeah, okay. theaters sound pretty interesting. I mean, a lot of them well, are streets, the Madison, I mean, the Hilliard. Yeah. When, when, when I moved to New York, one of the attractions there was 42nd Street, which was still thriving, showing, uh, you know, exploitation and horror movies in the late 70s and early 80s. Now that's gone, too. Right. But that, you know, at one time, uh, part of downtown Cleveland was was close to being like 42nd Street. Um and on on uh, on Euclid, there was uh, the Hippodrome, which was the, the by far, as I said, largest theater. It had nearly four thousand seats, wow. a large balcony, and it was one of those ones built in the golden days of theater. So it was really amazing looking theater. I bet. And and right across the street from it was a smaller but also great theater called the Embassy. And I'm sure there's no, you can't even see that they used to be there anymore, but uh, those were the two main theaters when I went downtown to see movies the most, which was in the 70s, that were showing double bills of horror movies and black exploitation movies and action movies. It's... Um, and it was just all kinds of great stuff. And, um, and then just, you know, a little bit farther down on Euclid, the theaters that are, are still there, uh, the Playhouse Square theaters, uh, at one time, there were five. I'm not sure how many are still operating now, but uh, there was the Hannah, which was for plays, and then there were four theaters that on and off showed movies. And when I was really young, I saw some movies there um, with with relatives, and uh, later on, I used to go see rock bands in some of those theaters. I think the Allen was the one that mainly had rock bands. So there, that's 
That's seven theaters right there. I don't think <clears throat> any of those are, are still around. Downtown is just pretty much Tower City. That's where you can go see movies at now. Well, d- didn't the Playhouse Square theaters have a major renovation, and some of them came back if only to show plays? They're mostly plays. Occasionally, Playhouse Square will show, like, do a special feature in the summer where they show movies once a week, like older movies, but it's, it's pretty rare. It's mainly okay. main, that whole Euclid uh, district is just for um, just for plays. Uh, as far as and and I mentioned, I remember uh, in one of your reviews you mentioned there was a theater on like one um, seventeenth and either Detroit or Clifton. Well, yeah, let me get to Lakewood in a second, but okay. just, just let me finish up downtown. Yeah, of course. So that that's six theaters that were all <clears throat> basically in a row on on Euclid, and then there was one on Prospect, a, a little really crappy theater called the Standard that showed sex movies, yeah, like pre porn sex movies. Right. I mean, they, they showed all kinds of great stuff there. And then the most interesting of all, really, was on, on Ninth Street, which wasn't a movie theater, but the Roxy Burlesque Theater, which at one point was showing movies, too. But they had old-fashioned strip shows, which, which I used to go to a lot when I was in high school. And uh, so then, basically, that's what was downtown. And um, in, in Lakewood... Uh, Basically, everywhere in Greater Cleveland, everywhere in America, at one time, there were neighborhood theaters everywhere. Because, you know, before TV really took off, everybody went to movies. And some of them were gone by the time I was born and when I was a kid. But when I was a kid in, in, in Lakewood, there were three theaters on Detroit. <clears throat> Excuse me. Of course, there's the famous Detroit that was there the longest and only recently closed. And then down by 117th, there were two of them, uh, the home, <coughs> excuse me, the Homestead, uh, which was still showing movies like Midnight Movies in, in the 70s or the late 70s, which uh, for a while, uh, um, the Drome record store, which I worked for in the late 70s, was putting on uh, rock shows in there and, and a few movies. We did some Midnight Movies. We showed a racer head there. And then later on, uh, the club that's connected to it became the Fantasy. Right. That's so. That's still so that's around. the Homestead, and everybody knows that building because it's been used for other things over the years. Right. But right across the border in Cleveland, uh, on the other side of 117th, was the Granada Theater, which is long gone. Yeah. Uh, but that was a major theater when I was a kid, and I, I think the last movie I saw there was probably Planet of the Apes. Okay. Were most of these theaters, I'd imagine, then were single screens. Then, oh yeah, absolutely. This is all, you know, before they 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 split them up and cloned them. Right, and it would and, they would show like yeah. one movie per week, or would they um, would they show multiple movies over well, the course? Well, at of one week? time they were all first run theaters, which right. would have one movie per week exactly. Um, the downtown theaters uh, usually had double bills. And, and some of the theaters in the suburbs had uh, had double bills too, especially on Saturday matinees. But there there were the three on on Detroit, and the, the Detroit was the closest one to me. I could ride my bike there, so I went there the most. Uh, you know, when I was a kid, and, and we went went to a lot of Saturday matinees at the Detroit. They showed all kinds of great stuff. And then also in in Lakewood or, or near Lakewood, there were uh, let's see, there were on Madison, there were uh, two theaters. Um, one of them I only went to a few times because it was too far away, but there was a theater called the Madison Theater on, by 93rd Street. But you could go there on a bus if there was something you really wanted to see. And there was a theater, I, I just looked this up because it's, it's long gone and most people in Lakewood don't even remember it was there. There was a theater called the Lincoln. Um, that was on Madison by a street called Arthur. Yeah. Well, and uh, at least when, when I was a kid, for most of the time, it was already closed, but you could still see the marquee. And I think there might have been a carpet store in there. And when I was in school, it was next door to a uh, kind of a deli store called Twins. But anyway, that's that's one that's long gone. And then on, uh, on Hilliard, uh, let's see, there was uh, the Hilliard Theater. And uh, that was there for a long time and went through a lot of changes. When I was a kid, it was a regular neighborhood theater. Then it changed to the Westwood Art Theater, uh, which 
showed European, you know, so-called art films, and then started showing more and more sex films until it eventually became a porno theater, which was amazing to me because it was only a few blocks from Harding, where I went to junior high school. Right. Did uh, most of these theaters start closing in the late later later seventies? Different or? times for different ones, but yes, yeah, the seventies was kind of the the end for it. Is, uh, th- is that what prompted your move to New York City to be closer to um, to being able to see these movies at 42nd Street? That was the main, the main part of it, absolutely. Um, like I say, at the time when I moved to New York, 42nd Street and that area was still really happening. And, uh, you know, there were a lot of theaters there showing double bills of horror movies and exploitation movies. And, that you know, that was still going through most of the 80s, and then that all ended, too. So, you know, you don't have movie theaters like that pretty much anywhere any, anymore. Right. W- when was the rise of the multiplex? Was that like in the uh, the 80s or 90s when it well, just started it being all goes these? Back to the, the, it goes back to the 70s is when uh, mall theaters started opening. The first mall theater I went to was at Westgate Shopping Center, and now I know that's even gone. That's been gone for quite a while. Yes. Uh, but, you know... The, the mall theaters started, and then the older theaters started dividing themselves, which was really not a good thing because, uh, you know, you were at the wrong angle to watch the movies, and if the movie next door to you was loud, you'd hear the movie next door. That didn't really work out too well. So there, there was two ways the theaters stayed open in the 70s. One was to clone themselves, divide themselves, and the other one was to show porn movies. Yeah. And, uh, you know, those are both pretty much things of the past but that's what was going on in the 70s and how many like drive-ins were there around here i know there was a big one where american greetings took over over on memphis uh, people talk about a lot there there was there there were quite a few uh drive-ins i didn't go to drive-ins that much uh i do remember the first movie i saw in a drive-in uh was in 1970 and it was uh, russ meyer's beyond the valley of the doll oh wow um, but I, my memories of the of the hard top theaters uh, are much stronger than the drive ins right. because yeah I just didn't go to drive ins that much I usually didn't have a car yeah uh, and I was either too young to have a car or by the time I had a car I, I was using it for other things and my parents never went to drive ins right so I didn't have that experience of going to drive ins as like as a kid like a lot of people did and I read in uh, from reading your book it sounds like your father was a magician. Uh, well, he was uh, he was a magician. He was a uh, uh, magician who did shows frequently all over the greater Cleveland area for just about every kind of group you can think of. At different times, he also was a ventriloquist and, and a uh, hypnotist. Wow. And uh, he was, you know, big in magic circles and belonged to the magic clubs and uh, knew the famous magicians who came into town and... Uh, had done uh, uh, magic shows in, in Europe, uh, USO kind of shows during World War II. And, yeah, I, I could talk about him all day. But, yeah. Uh, yeah, he was a magician, and he also worked at the Cleveland Press for 35 years. So you said in the early 70s you started working at Drome Records. And is that where you met the people who uh, formed Mirrors? Uh, no, that's actually a lot of different things things in the 70s. In the, in the early 70s, my first record store job was at uh, Record Rendezvous downtown, uh, right by Public Square. The, the small, there were two Record Rendezvous downtown, the big one on Prospect, and a, and a really small one kind of for uh, commuters, um, which was in Public Square, and I worked there for a while. Um, when I worked at the Drome, the Drome didn't even exist then, uh, I worked at the Drome uh, starting in 1977. Okay. And, and the Drome had three different locations, so it gets complicated. But I was at the original location on the east side, and then uh, it moved to uh, Lakewood right next to uh, the former Homestead Theater. And you said uh, when you were working at Drome, you would sometimes show movies or sponsor movies or something? Uh, well, yeah, just a few times. Um, we had... Uh, had an agreement with uh, the owner of the Homestead Theater, who I think he passed away just a few years ago, uh, Mr. DeFrazia, and uh, he owned the Homestead, 
and it was nothing was going on in there at the time. So uh, John Thompson, who owned the Drome, made some kind of deal with him, and we had bands in there a couple times. Um, uh, the B-52s made their uh, Cleveland uh, debut in, in, in the uh, former Homestead Theater way before their album even came out. And um, so other bands played in there, and we showed uh, Eraserhead as a midnight movie. That was probably like not when it first came out then, I'd imagine, like 1978 around that time. It was like 78, 79. And uh, it didn't do well. (laughs) Not too many people (laughs) came. And it it used to frustrate us because there were lines at the Westwood Theater for uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show. Yeah, it still is, huh? (laughs) Yeah, is it? It's uh, that, you know, it's just... We used to... I remember going to the... uh, John and I went to the uh, to the lines of people waiting to see Rocky Horror Picture Show, and we're passing out flyers saying, "Try something different. Yeah. <laughs> Come to this theater and see Eraserhead." And you know, there'd be like twenty people in the audience, but, how but would, it was a good experience and it was fun. So back then, before the internet, and how would you hear about a movie like Eraserhead? Were there like um, magazines coming out, like telling you about these movies that are playing? Or well, yes, there were, and I, you know, I had always bought. Uh, horror and science fiction magazines and fanzines, so I knew about stuff through that, but specifically the movie Eraserhead, uh, one of the guys that worked at the Drome, Jim Ellis, had gone to New York um, and seen it there and found out the the, the distributor info. He came back with like a, a promo package, you know, here's how you can rent this movie. Right, and did you, when did you first start writing like movie reviews or cataloging movies? When I worked at the Drome, the original Drome, um, I had been cataloging movies just as a hobby for for a long time, my own scrapbooks and my own notes and things like that. But the first time I wrote anything for the public was when uh, guys who worked at the Drome, including uh, John Thompson and Jim Ellis and uh, David Thomas of Perubu, started a uh, publication called Clee. And it uh, started out as a newspaper, and later on it was a magazine. And for the first uh, few issues, I wrote uh, movie reviews for movies that were on TV in the greater Cleveland area, mostly on Channel 61 and 43 at the time. All right, and is that in the days of uh, Goularty? No, Goularty was way before that. Yes, way before, okay. Way before that. Uh, Goularty was a huge phenomenon. Brief, right? Uh, Gallardi was like 1963 to 1966. Okay, and that was a, a huge influence on on me and a lot of musicians and 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 people that grew up in Greater Cleveland. But yeah, he was he was long gone by then. At the time, uh, by the 70s, uh, the Ghoul was on TV, right? And he was like the second generation uh, Gallardi clone. And at some point, Big Chuck and Houlihan got on there. Well, Big Chuck and Houlihan started immediately after Gallardi. They okay. took over his time slot on Channel 8. And uh, later on, it became uh, Big Chuck and Little John. And uh, Big Chuck kept that show going for an incredible number of years. I, I think he must hold the record for hosting a local uh, horror or a local movie show. Because he started, he started, he was on the Gallardi show, uh, you know, in the background and in the skits going back to 63, and then he started hosting in 66. Wow. So if you know when that show ended, it was a long time. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty recent when it ended. I yes. was watching that. Did, were there other horror, horror hosts on like Channel 43 and Channel 61 then? That would, or was, Well, at one time, uh, the, the Ghoul was on, and then the Ghoul later relocated in, De- in Detroit. And uh, I, 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 I had a lot of time talking to guys from the Stooges uh, who were fans of the Ghoul. Wow. Uh, Ron Ashton and Iggy, you know, huh. told me that they like watching the Ghoul in Detroit. That's awesome. Uh, there was another one that, that wasn't as fun or as interesting, uh, but he showed some cool movies called Super Host. Okay. Sounds he was really on one familiar. of those UHF channels for quite a while. And there were some other ones that were really brief that just kind of came and went. But, uh, yeah, the, as far as movie hosting in Cleveland, um, Big Chuck was the one who was on the longest. 
So when did you get the idea to start uh, publishing a magazine? Is that after you um, moved to New after York? I moved to, after I moved to New York, I had, you know, kind of been, uh, I was always, always, something like that was always in the back of my mind, but I was kind of inspired by the uh, the punk do-it-yourself fanzine uh, phenomena that was going on at the time. So my first publication after I moved to New York was a weekly uh Xerox stapled hand lettered psychotronic. And how did you get subscribers? Did you did you know people in New York or were you just uh, advertising in a like a magazine or newspaper? I, I did know some people in New York cuz New York was pretty much flooded with people from Cleveland at that time, uh, mostly musicians. But um I uh started getting distribution just by walking around to different like comic book and uh, record stores, bookstores, leaving them on consignment. And then I got some local publicity, um, most majorly in the Village Voice, and started getting subscribers in the New York area. And then eventually I got subscribers all over the country, even though the movies I was writing about were only shown on TV in New York. Wow. Did you have anybody working with you, or were you just doing this all by yourself? I had a number of people uh, on a volunteer basis helping me out. Right. Uh, um, at first, mostly writing, and later on with with layouts and things. As as that got a little bit better, because the first ones are really crude. Yeah. Um, you know, done on a on a uh, either handwritten or partially on a typewriter and, and Xerox. But yeah, there's there's a number of people that helped me out, and uh, some of them had uh, Ohio roots had lived in Ohio or were born in Ohio. And uh, how did you get the... Did you always have an idea that you wanted to publish a book, like an encyclopedia-type book for these movies? Well, that kind of came later, but it just seemed like a natural thing to do. At the time, there probably wasn't anything like that. There had been some books of movie reviews, but they were a little... Uh, they were segregated, is what they were. They they would be all horror movies, or all science fiction movies, and I kind of just, in my mind, they all belong together. Right. Yeah. I really like the the term psychotronic and the sort of it encompasses probably like eighty percent of or ninety percent of what I what I enjoy watching. Oh, good. It's, yeah, uh, the, the idea with the word was kind of psycho for horror and tronic for science fiction. Right. And then, and then if the word was longer, I would add it in another syllable to cover exploitation movies. Yeah. Because that was a huge part of it. It's, you know, uh, on TV, some, and in theaters, a lot, they were mixed up. You know, it would be mixed up horror, science fiction, and exploitation movies of all types, uh, along with comedies. And a lot of the comedies were horror comedies or science fiction comedies yeah. or exploitation comedies. So it just all fit. Right. And so the book was published by Ballantine. Did yeah. you, uh, did they, from word of mouth about your magazine, did they like give you uh, an advance that they were going to publish this? Uh, more or less, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, that's just... It's great. I'd read about your book for years. I have having no idea that you were from Cleveland, but I, there's lots of books coming out now that are like um, a lot of them are specialty, like uh, the Nightmare USA. I might have been reading. Uh, I was reading that, and in the, the bibliography, I saw your book, and that might have been the first time I became aware of your book. But I had read about it in a lot of, um, yeah, as, as like um, as the Godfather of these types of books, having no idea that you were your, about your Cleveland roots. Yeah, that, that first book was in print for a really long time for that type of book, but now it's been out of print for a long time. So it's, you know, people are selling it for high prices on the Internet, I understand. Right, which is uh, how I bought it. Um, <laughs> and some of the, like, the movies you mentioned, which probably had never been, most of them had probably never been written about before, but you provide a lot of background information. Like, how, how were you able to find out all this information back then? Well, it was a combination of my memory of seeing movies, um, w watching movies while I was working on the book, and a lot of research. And uh, New York was a great place for doing the research because they have the Lincoln Center Film Library. Oh, yeah. Uh, I spent a lot of time up there um, looking at uh, old newspapers on microfilm and um, 
I, I got to go through archives, different archives around New York. Of um, I went through archives of old photographs at major <laughs> newspapers and uh, archives of old posters from the, the companies that used to exist that uh, distributed the posters and the publicity material um, for all the different movie companies, to all the different theaters. So, yeah, I learned a lot working on that book. I also did uh, some research when I visited Europe for the first time. And, uh, you know, it's just the more you find out, the more you know you don't know. Right, right. Uh, you know, with movies or anything else, really. But with all the movies I put in there, if I would have known what I know now or would have had access to even VHS tapes, which I didn't when I worked Right, when, book, when did those it, first come around? That was, that was in the early 80s, right? Um, yeah, they go back, actually, you know, to beta, the beta started in the late 70s. Um, although hardly anybody had it, and it it just got bigger and bigger and bigger, and then when the VHS became the main thing uh, in the 80s is when it really took off. It really took off after my book came out, actually. Right. So, you know, some of the movies that I could only describe all of a sudden were available on VHS just a few years later. And, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing how, obviously, the VHS thing was so huge... And now it's a distant memory, and they're trying to practically give them away at flea markets. Oh, yeah. That's pro still probably the only fun I can still have as far as searching for rare movies is going to flea markets and searching, digging through VHS, because that's it's still fun trying to discover titles or weird big box uh, VHS yeah. tapes and stuff. And that's what, the way I learned about a lot of movies is just... Yeah, and there, there's a few, a few dealers that, are, that specialize and sell rare VHS tapes yeah. know, for collector prices, but usually you can find them really cheap. Yeah, yeah, if you go, if you travel a little bit and, and go to old, vid or when old video stores were starting to just close, like, massively around the country, they were just, yeah, like, two for a dollar, you know, selling their VHS. And that's that's the future of DVDs. Right, exactly. Um, but having it all available on the internet just sort of takes the fun out of it. I, I know I, I have a list of movies I, I want to track down, and sometimes I know I could probably like get on a torrent or something and watch them. But I, I hate watching movies on my computer, and I, I try yeah. to stick to like you know I'm going to find you know track down a hard copy of this movie somewhere. I, yeah, I agree. I, I I love the internet for things that I can see more music oriented. Right. Um, I. I look up a lot of things on YouTube, uh, with, you know, for music clips, right. whether it's audio or visual. Um, but I don't, I don't watch movies on the internet. No, I'd like watching maybe like old trailers on YouTube, but uh, but trailers I don't. I, good, yeah. But I, yeah, I don't want to watch a movie on my computer, and so um, a lot of the VHS titles aren't available on DVD. So it's still fun just to go on like hunts, you know. I was out at the Pennsylvania, Ohio border towns going to old video stores just a few months ago and scored, you know, like over 100 tapes probably of stuff I'd never heard of. Wow. So that's still, uh, for me, uh, the fun I can have uh, <laughs> trying to okay. hear about new movies, but or, or movies, you know, not new, but stuff I haven't you heard of. music also? Yeah, I don't have. I find I don't have the patience to dig through record bins. Like I would go with my friend, and he would be digging oh, these crates where they would sell like ten records for a dollar. And I have the patience to look through like lots and lot like VHS all day. But with mu with music at a record store or something, after about a half hour, I kind of zone out. And there's just just okay. too. I do I do collect me, but my uh, my VHS collection greatly. Yeah, you know, is a much bigger than my 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 vinyl. I probably have like a hundred vinyl and hundreds and hundreds of of tapes, just because uh, so I feel like I. Know. Lived, how long have you lived in Greater Cleveland? I was born in Oberlin. I grew up in Lagrange nearby there, and I've lived in Lakewood for about four years. And I'm, four years, okay. Yeah. So yeah, it's like there's so much Lakewood and Cleveland history that that you've only heard about. Exactly. Um, yeah, there's hardly any. Like I was saying, like the Cinematheque is the theater I go to the most because they show okay. old movies. But a lot of them are just um, art, more like art films and stuff. It's it's rare that they'll sure. actually show a B movie or an exploitation movie. They showed Last House on the Left for Halloween one year, but that's, wow. as, that's as close as they'll get to a sleaze, I think. Well, when, when I still live there, I remember going there to see Aguirre, The Wrath of God. Oh, that would be amazing. Um, I love Herzog. So yes, yes, and and probably some other Herzog too. And then in the 80s, 
um, they had me come back to Cleveland and do a, a film series there, which which was a lot of fun because I did film series in different cities and different countries, but that's the only time that I got to do a film series in a really nice uh, theater like that yeah. and show widescreen movies. Right. So, yeah. Do you really have any film prints of movies? Like I never, I never collected film. That's prints. an expensive that's, hobby. <laughs> that's too uh, too uh, uh, expensive a hobby for me. When I was doing film shows, I would uh, rent them from other people or companies. Right. And so you're in uh, Augusta, Georgia now, right? I am. Are there any theaters down there that you still or that you can go to that would play older movies or anything? Not older movies, not right now. Um, there's a good theater here called The Masters, uh, which is a, uh, they, people call it a dollar theater, but it's actually $2. Yeah. And, and that's cool because they show recent uh, movies, not first run, but recent ones for $2. And it's, it's actually a nice theater. But as far as older stuff, uh, there's a f- you know, showings at screenings at a, a museum once in a while. Something like that. There is something not far from here I just heard about that I, I'm kind of psyched to see. In, in Atlanta, somebody is not only showing old movies, but they're putting on old-fashioned spook shows, oh. live shows. <laughs> I would love to see that. Yeah, and they, I said I asked somebody who told me, I said, is it just like on Halloween? And they don't know. They do it every once in a while uh, with, a, like, a magician on stage and, you know, uh, blackouts and things painted in neon uh, day glow and all that kind of stuff so i might want to try that so at, at home what's your preferred format for watching movies do you mainly watch like dvds now um to tell you the truth and since we moved here and we're still getting organized mostly i watch movies on television okay cable. right right i'm um, just kind of catching up on things i missed in the theaters um, sure. i haven't been i haven't been buying uh dvds or renting them, I don't even know where I'd rent them anymore, and I haven't done Netflix or anything like that yet. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I, my, there were periods in my life when I watched movies so intensely, I, I couldn't get through a day without watching a few <laughs> movies. Right. And uh, I've slacked off since then, and it, to tell you the truth, it was kind of a, re- of a relief. Yeah. You know? Um, and I might get back to that again. There's a lot of stuff I missed over the years. But, uh, do you, do you, uh, is there still like, um, do you still feel like the, the urge to explore, or do you feel like you've discovered most everything from from like the 20th century, from the 70s and 80s? Are there still like no, titles that'll pop up that you're interested in? Or do you, absolutely, absolutely. You could take any decade, and there's going to be movies that I wish I could see or I missed, or even have been recently discovered yeah um you know movies that you know, for one reason or another never got released and somebody found a copy and put it out and, you know sometimes they're just you can see why they weren't released but sometimes they're really interesting <laughs> and the farther back you go uh kind of the more exciting it gets because right. you start getting into the silent movies and you realize like i don't know I don't know what the figure is, but maybe 70% of the silent movies are lost forever. I remember and reading every, that. Every, every once in a while, somebody discovers one in, in, in another country in a film museum archive or something. And, you know, this is a movie people have been looking for for 70 years. And it's like, whoop, there it is, you know, <laughs> or, or, or longer, you know. Do you have, like, a master list somewhere of movies, like uh, like uh, the ones you've been seeking out, like, your whole life that occasionally no, you'll don't. get the cross out? No, I, I don't. Do you have uh, a favorite decade for movies or a favorite era? Uh, if I, you know what, I would have to say two decades. I'd say the 30s yeah. and the 70s. Wow. Um, and the, the 30s, because growing up in the... In the 50s and 60s, when old movies are on TV all the time, morning, noon, and night, uh, and it was great, you know. Um, the majority of the movies when I was a kid that were on TV were from the 30s and 40s, but mostly from the 30s. And even though TV at the time was really b- mostly pretty bland, a lot of the movies were from the Depression, and a lot of them were pre-code movies and just amazing stuff. And not just feature films, but shorts, too, and comedy shorts and cartoons. So I've really got a, a love for 30s movies. And then in, in my own lifetime, 
I think the probably the big the the, the strongest decade for uh, really good movies and groundbreaking movies was the seventies because the seventies was the first decade after the filmmakers got the freedom to do more or less what they wanted to within the rating system. Right, like late 60s, the rules just started going out the window, and lots of people yeah. were doing drugs back then, and just Absolutely. movies just started getting weirder and weirder. It's you, All of a sudden, you get more controversial content, better special effects, uh, more more politics, more nudity, more swearing, more gore, you name it, and it all was coming at once. And some of the movies were full of those things, but crappy movies, yeah. and other ones were really good. And, you know, there's that whole kind of cliche of all these guys who started out with Roger Corman making major films. Right. But it's true. It is, yeah. And, yeah, and, uh, you know, I mean, there's movies I like from every decade, but the 70s, was to me, was really strong. So I, I totally agree, and I'm just now getting back into the... Th I grew up watching, like, 30s movies because my, my parents were very strict, and I couldn't watch anything PG-13 or R, you know, there. So mm -hmm. I, I grew up watching a lot of universal horror movies and, and you know, Frankenstein and Dracula. And then just recently, I, I watched Mad Love and these old... and M and Peter Lorre movies. And, exactly. And you, first you see the, the universals, which are great, and, and maybe, like, monograms, and then you start finding these really bizarre ones made by, like, MGM and Paramount, that are even better looking movies and more perverted. Than right? The other yeah, yeah. That it's it's amazing how much they got away with and just how like yeah messed up they are. How black the humor is. The lighting yeah. is incredible and like almost all these '30s movies uh, and they're compact too, like 67 minutes. You know, like some no of them, no yeah. filler. Uh, yeah. I, some some of my favorite '30s movies just off the top of my head: Island of Lost Souls. Just incredible to me. I could you know watch that every couple of years. And and not a horror movie, but uh, a really bizarre, funny movie, International House. I never even heard of that one. Yeah, check it out. It's like a, it's got a cast including W. C. Fields, Bella Lugosi, and Cab Calloway. Wow. Yeah, luckily the Lakewood Library still stocks a lot of. I know I have like Island of Lost Souls right now. Rent. I always rent way more movies than I have time to watch, but I have just stacks of movies rented out from the Lakewood Library, and from the Cleveland. I gotta say, Lakewood Public Library. library was a major part of my growing up. Um, always a great library. I spent a lot of time in there since I was a little kid looking at Dr. Seuss books to when I was a little bit older going through their, um, their research uh, books because they had a good film section. And books that I couldn't find to buy or couldn't afford, I'd go there. Wow. And, uh, yeah, a lot, a, lot, a lot of good times at the, at the Lakewood Library and, and also the Lakewood Y. <laughs> where I was a member for a long time. I try to join, but it's expensive. The why? <laughs> Is it? Well, it wasn't when I was a kid. <laughs> yeah, it's real, real pricey. Uh, are there any movies like that you do? You have like a list that you? I mean, you've published two books now, and the second one is just massive. It's probably like triple the size of the or triple the amount of titles yeah. from the third one. It's yeah. huge. I've been I've been going through them. Uh, since I was a kid, I, I I got a movie book when I was like 12, and I wasn't allowed to watch these movies, like I said, but I would just go through and highlight all the movies I wanted to see. I got uh, My grandma bought me Video Hound's Movie Guide, like 98 edition, sure. and I still have that with just all these yellow highlights of all the things I couldn't wait till, uh, to see, and then when I turned 16, I would just go rent. They still had like lots of video stores around, and I could rent five movies, five days, five dollars, you know, these deals, and just spend and all my time in the basement. You your, your parents trying to stop you from watching movies that just made you want to watch them more oh, right? of course i just couldn't yeah. i was just itching to watch i know whatever they told me was like the mo like i asked my mom like what's the like worst movie you've ever seen and she was like oh just a clockwork orange is just horrible it's, uh, you know they were very religious she said, it's just it's mm -hmm. uh, and it just telling me how like messed you know how, the more they would tell me about these like messed up movies that they saw you know that you're just awful that those were the ones i wanted to see the most uh, my dad told me about Race with the Devil. I couldn't wait to see that, you know. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So. <laughs> Clockwork Orange, that, that movie had a, a big cultural impact. I mean, yeah. uh, I, I remember, like, in, 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 the, in the 70s, you could see how movies like Clockwork Orange and, and uh, maybe Cabaret and some other ones influenced the early punk rock scene. And the oh, yeah, scene. yeah. Uh, you can, yeah, definitely see it in the styles of, from, from pictures from that era, eyeliner and stuff. Um, so, your store that you run down there in Georgia now, this, it's a, the Psychostronic store, I believe it's called, right? Or, yes, it is. Um, what, do you sell movies and music there? Posters, sell, stuff like that? Uh, or? Our, our best 
best-selling item right now is vinyl records. Um, we're doing really well with vinyl records. Uh, we also sell CDs, even though that, that market is kind of fading. Uh, I sell movie posters, and I'm hoping to expand that and sell more and get more. Uh, we do still sell DVDs, although that's fading, too. And uh, we stopped carrying VHS tapes some years ago when we had a store in, in, VHS, in, in, in Virginia, uh, just because the price was dropping so much I couldn't justify the space to keep them in there. Right, right. Do you, do you yourself have a, a large personal collection? Like the v only VHS tapes that I kept, and of course at one time I had thousands of them, uh, if, if you start to move across the country, you start thinking about cutting your uh, stock. You know? Right. So uh, mostly I kept rock and roll related ones, music related ones. Okay. Things there that I didn't think I'd be able to find easily. Most of the feature films I sold off, gave away, or, or dumped. There was this amazing video store near where I grew up, near Elyria, or in, it was in Elyria, I grew up near there, uh, called Bookseller Video that was around from the mid-80s, and they just finally went out of business, I think last, like 2011, like Christmas time, and that was just a, for a place called Bookseller, you wouldn't imagine it, but go, going inside there was just a warehouse full of VHS, and mm -hmm. they, they were selling all their titles really quick, and like, probably a half my collection comes from when they were going out of business, just, or from over the years, just buying stuff from there. Nowadays, the only video stores that really carry that are like these specialty stores like Scarecrow Video out in Seattle or Movie Madness mm -hmm. in Portland. But for a place that's just totally unaware of everything they had, I found so many just crazy movies there. And especially uh, like, yeah, my favorite era is, yeah, is from the 70s also, just these weird movies that are just unclassifiable. Didn't You Hear or Liza's Horoscope or just oddball things I discovered out there. There's plenty of those. Right. Um, you live in Lakewood now, right? Yes. Are there any record stores or music stores in Lakewood anymore? There's a record store called My Mind's Eye, which mm -hmm. has been around for for a while. I think since the '90s, it's been around for a long time. And they just moved. They were across, they were right across from Angelo's Pizza on Warren and Bunce. I mean, on okay. Madison and Bunce for a long time, and they just they just moved down uh, further west on Detroit. The, the oldest um, Lakewood record store, as far as I know was on Detroit, and it was called Melody Lane. No, I've never even heard of that. Yeah. It was there for a long time, although it might have been gone for a long time. And yeah. I, you know, I can remember going there, like, in 1966. So, um, I, and then, yeah. I've heard a lot about Beware Video. Uh, were you ever yeah. around when that was? I know that, clo that closed well, no, right when I was, I was first gone by get... the time they were there, yeah. but I talked to the, the people that ran it, and they used to sell my magazine. Wow. It sounded like a good place. How long was um, your magazine published for? About 18 years. Eight, starting in the early 80s and continuing on until like the late 90s then? Late 80s. Oh, okay. Uh, until, up, up until this century. Oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, there... Another thing about uh, Lakewood is, is how much the, or Cleveland actually, is how much the, the radio scene changed over the years. Yeah. Uh, you know, I was a, a kid when the radio was all AM. And the big rock stations were WHK and Wixie. And then the uh, FM radio started coming in around 67. And uh, at first it was not whole stations. It was just stations that usually played classical music or polkas or ethnic music. And they'd have special shows, the midnight shows. That was the best. Wow, yeah. That was the best radio I've ever heard. Um, when... It was truly underground and free form radio. Yeah, and there were there were two guys that, to me, were the main guys. This is early on, late sixties, early seventies. There was a guy named Martin Perlick, uh, who was kind of the uh, artier intellectual DJ, and a guy named Doc Nemo, who was kind of like Gulardi on the radio, who would use echo chambers and, <laughs> and yell and tell jokes and play early heavy metal stuff, you know, like what, Stephen Wolf and Blue Cheer. What station was that? Do you remember? Uh, geez, could it have been CKLW? Uh, no, that's Detroit. Um, I don't remember the names of the stations right now. You'd have to look that up. But these these were pre-WMMS. Right. When when the first underground freeform radio started in Cleveland, and I, I know Martin Perlick later worked at WMMS, which is probably still there, right? 
Oh, WMMS is still there, yeah, but it's garbage. Yeah. Uh, is it okay? Oh yeah, it's it's well, terrible. It's, um, <laughs> well, it, at one time it was it was okay, but yeah, if I've heard I've about, heard tales of how great it, how great it used to be. Okay, um, and one thing that people there might not even remember is when MM, early MMS, three of the guys that were on there went to Lakewood High School. Oh wow! And uh, you know, I could I know one of them later, a, a guy who called himself Tree, this really tall, <laughs> nice guy. He moved to California and died a long time ago. And uh, the other two, I don't know what happened to them, but uh, yeah. So there's a lot of liquid uh, involvement in WMMF. And uh, yeah, there, there used to be a lot of good uh, record stores around. There was the record rendezvous stores I mentioned, and there was a, a chain called Record Revolution that was really good. They I've heard of that. I've, a lot of our vinyl that we have here, and we've been around since 76 and getting vinyl, but a lot of them say donated by Record Revolution, I, I've noticed. Okay. You know, they they were good stores. They had a lot of imports, and uh, for a while there was a, a small chain called Disc Records. They had a really good one on Euclid downtown, and then they opened one in Westgate. Used to get a lot of stuff from them. Yeah, that that sounds like it was a much better place to live back then. Well, you know, it was different. Yeah, it was different. It's just so hard to I I don't know just just. Fine. I, there's there's some good record stores, and Cleveland still has a very strong music scene. But as far as movies go, it's just, I guess anywhere, it's just so hard it's to tough every anywhere yeah. for movies. Uh, you know, if you're lucky, if you have a a, a corporate multiplex, right? You know, that's about it. The neighborhood theaters are pretty much a thing of the past. Uh, revival theaters that were a big deal for for a while, uh, they're pretty much gone. There used to be a good revival theater in Cleveland. I don't even remember the name of it, but uh, I, you know, I'd go there with my grandfather and see Charlie Chaplin movies. You know, have uh, you saw it? Fun Nosferatu and Dr. Caligari there. What I don't understand is why there are no movie theaters that just show old movie. I mean, I guess like the Cinematheque, but like a, a place that would, there's so many movies. Like even though, like my dream would ha to be like have a 24 hour movie theater and the movies get just crappier as the night goes on. You know, it's a good dream, but you better be wealthy because you're. You're going to have to, 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 you know, rent or own the theater. You're probably going to have to renovate the theater. You're probably going to have to upgrade the projectors if they even still have them. And then you got to, you got to remember, you got to pay a staff. You got to clean the place. You got to yeah. air condition the place. You got to heat the place. You got to find. It goes on and on. Probably, to, and to show movies in public or to charge money for them, you'd have to track down who who made the movie. You know. Well, that aside, just yeah. to get people to come. Yeah. People just don't naturally go to see old movies in theaters like they used to. Well, I know. I've, there are people that would love to do it. I've know. tried to do movie I for a long time at a, a coffee shop bar in Lakewood. I was doing double, monthly double features, uh, okay. you know, forgotten movies, and you know, mainly from the seventies and stuff. And and that was free. And just trying to get people to come out to that to see that was the the uh, attendance was sparse. Was it? Uh, were you projecting DVDs or VHS DVDs? I don't. I don't have you know like access to film prints of anything. Obviously. Right. Um, well, that's another big expense, and they're harder to find than than it used to be. There was a time when you could mail get a mail order catalog full of thousands of titles, including all kinds of great obscure and old cult movies. Yeah. And you could rent them really cheap. You know, uh, they'd be free if you were a nonprofit organization. A lot of times, you just pay the shipping. And I don't even think those companies exist anymore. I was in Los Angeles a couple or a month or two ago, and there's this great movie theater called the Silent Movie Theater out there. And they were, uh, I got to see Play Misty for Me, The Brood, like while I was uh, just in the week I was out there. Right before I left there, showing Dennis Hopper's Out of the Blue, which is one of my favorite movies of all time. Huh. But yeah. uh, <laughs> I, I, I did get to see it. But I guess I guess you have to go to probably L.A. or New York to to be near these theaters that still show this really cool. Well, stuff. true, and and you know I. I saw them close one after another in New York. Uh, when I moved to New York, there were a number of revival theaters. As far as I know, they're all gone. Hmm. There were still ethnic theaters. When I moved to New York, there were like at least three movies theaters showing all Chinese movies. They're all long gone. Um, it's 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 not just believe me. It's not just Cleveland. It's every city of any size anywhere. The movie-going experience has just gone downhill. And, I know. You know, uh, drive-ins, too. You know, I could, we could probably talk for hours 
I gotta go open my store. Right, yeah, I, I remember you saying that. And, it was. Yeah, it's the top of the hour, and you are listening to WCSB Cleveland. Michael, thanks so much for coming on. Really appreciate it. Do you want to announce when your um, radio show's on so that people here could tune in? Yeah, um, it, it starts this Friday, and uh, Friday night, this Friday night at 10 o'clock, and the station is called 95 Rock. Uh, it's out of Augusta. It's a, uh, actually a corporate station owned by the Beasley Broadcasting. And, of course, it's live streaming. So you can, uh, you can go to the live stream, and the address for that is 95, just the numbers, 95rock.com uh, slash streamer. Okay, and, and you could you could hear it from from anywhere. And you're going to be playing like music from like the 70s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, 60s, 70s, 80s. Uh, you know, I've I just had this uh, a local guy here named Matt made this beautiful poster for the show. Uh, just got it last night, and on it it says Garage Psych Metal Glam Funk Punk and more. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll be tuning in. I can't wait to hear it. Thanks so All much right. for coming onto the show and talking. Thanks for having me. All right, yeah, good luck with uh, your store and everything. Thank you. All right, bye. Bye.